Welcome to Island Baptist Church. Pastor Greg's lesson today is in Proverbs chapter 3, titled, It Might Overflow. We're in a series in, on Proverbs 3. When I started this series, I, I did not realize I was going to have to preach on this topic. I don't think it made a difference because I feel like the Lord led me here, but it's just, as I looked at it, it didn't think about it very much. But here we are with, with the title, It Might Overflow. I'm a big fan of reward programs. Anybody else love reward programs? I, I got a card in my, in, my, in my car. I think I got six stamps. And I think when I get one or two more, I get a free ice cream. I'm, in, I'm into the free ice cream. I'm into free whatever. Free is good. Free is my favorite amount to pay. And I'm into the rewards program. My wife and I have chosen to be in the miles program with our credit card. We pay our credit card off after, at the end of every month. We, we, I'm, not, I'm not saying go get one and do this, but I'm saying if, you got, if I'm going to spend it, I might as well get some back, and we travel to see our kids, and we fly them in from time to time. And so we get rewards, and I'm a fan of the reward program. And my daughter turned me on to a pro tip. She said, if you're going to pay your credit card bill off at the end of the year, and you owe a lot in taxes, that might be a good time to take out one of those new credit cards, pay the 3% on what you owe, and get more in cash back, and you actually come out ahead. So I haven't tried it, but she said she did it, and it worked good for her. So that's just a little bonus trip. It, tip, it's not, it's not biblical, but it's always good to, to work, to legally work the system for as much as you can and get those rewards back. At least that's how I feel about it. And so I participate in cash back and miles and restaurant cards and everything that I can to get a little bonus because I need my money stretched these days. My money's not going as far as it used to, and neither is yours. Just got an insurance bill, and they said, oh, the typical insurance is going up by 20 to 25% this year. Thank you very much. I love rewards program, and God, too, has a rewards program. It's found here in Proverbs, and we're going to explore that. Proverbs 3, 9, and 10. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops, and then your barns will be filled to overflowing. Your vats will brim over with new wine now scripture needs to be interpreted by scripture as always and we looked at last week uh, at some other verses we'll look at those in a minute but we have to understand that scripture doesn't always stand alone you can't just open the bible take your finger and put a spot and and understand all about that subject or see the the, the fullness of it because there are a lot of balancing scriptures that that keep us somewhere in the middle so that we don't we don't get into the health and wealth program here we're just you know you name it claim it kind of stuff out of one verse it's not good so all scriptures have to be in, interpreted in light of all of the scriptures we looked earlier in proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5 the word lord that's capitalized on on your screen is mentioned in two other verses in this same chapter in verse 5 it says trust the lord with all your heart and so we're supposed to trust god with our heart and and it doesn't mean you pull it out of your chest and you, 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 you cut it out or you ha hand it to him in that way. It's an it's a intangible asset that you have, your heart, all of your being. And in verse 7 it says, fear the Lord, capital L-O-R-D. We're supposed to respect God and the more we know Him, the more we respect Him. And uh, our fear probably turns into more respect than fear because we know Him. And then here in verse 9 it says, honor the Lord. And the word honor means add great weight to, or a heavy weight. Last week we, we looked at some scales, and, and, and we start off as believers in a lot of areas of our life, and we think, I know best, and we read the Scriptures, and we grow in the Lord, and pretty soon we tip, and then hopefully we get to the point where we're saying, I'm just going to trust God with all of my heart, all of my understanding. I'm not going to think I got it out. But God tells us the weight are tangible assets. A heavy weight, it's the tangible it's what sifts and flows through your hands. And when we trust God and when we respect God and we weight God with our goods, we participate in His rewards program. God gets to decide what honor means and we do not get to decide that. You guys have heard of the love languages, right? The love language. Um, I've never, I haven't read the book. I've perused the book. I, kind of, I understand the topic and the, 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 the concept. 
But my wife and I have different love languages. And if, if I know what she likes and I give her something different, that doesn't work. So let's, let's flip the, the tail there. If my wife says, I'm going to start loving my husband a whole lot more. And so I'm going to give him flowers every week. You, those of you who know me know how much that would bless me. And it's not very much. Thank you for the flowers, honey, but that's not my love language, no. And, and if, a, if another person you know really needs, is a person who thrives on encouragement, and you give them flowers, they're going to go, oh, these are nice. Or you buy them something on Amazon every week and it shows up. But that's not their love language. It's not going to connect with them. And we need to talk... God's love language with Him. Sometimes we just think, I'll do this for God, but then we ignore the very thing that He asks us to do. Which means, it's not His love language. What is God's love language? It is, and it's always been, trust and obey. That's God's love language. You want to say, I love you, trust Him. And then, when he says something, obey him. Believe what he says, do what he instructs. And he doesn't, he doesn't grade on a, on a bell curve. He's like, he tells you to do something, you do it, check the box. You don't do it, don't check the box. I used to love that in school. I could, I could, I could get by and see, look at the class and say, hey, that you know, we always get about 10 points extra so I don't have to try as hard. God's not that way. He demands our very, very best. So we're supposed to honor Him in His love language. Trust me, obey me, God says. So He says, honor the Lord with these two things, with your wealth. First, your wealth. From your sufficiency. The, the, the Hebrew word is, is, is all that I've given you so that you're sufficient to live. I came up with a, with a term that, that, that I like because I like to make up terms that works for me. He says, honor the Lord with your enoughness. Enoughness. God says, I've given you enough, and I want you to weight the scales toward me with the things I've given you with your enoughness. Well, let's imagine the gifting of God. Here we are. We're standing, we're standing here. Instead of me, God is here with you. On a, on a personal basis, and he says, I'm going to give each of you 10 M&Ms. And, uh, and let's pretend these are the old kind that used to melt in your mouth and not in your hands. You remember that saying? They don't say that anymore. Because if you put a pile of M&Ms in, if I gave you all 10 M&Ms right now, you would all be co- your hands would be colored, multicolored by the end of the service. But if, if God gave you 10 M&Ms, and these 10 M&Ms represented enoughness, then we can visualize the rest of what God is going, going to teach us through this message. So we're supposed to take our enoughness and honor God with it. And then secondly, the second word is our first fruits. Our first fruits, the very first that we have. It's the first in place, according to the Hebrew. It's the first in time. And it's the first in order or rank. It's the highest priority is to bless God, to honor God, with the things that flow through our hands. But does God really deserve firstness? Does He really deserve the first place in your life? Do you know Him? If you know Him, you know what the answer is. It's like He is the God of all sufficiency. You can trust Him, and He should be the very first place in your life. Why? Because God is the source of everything you have to begin with. The ten M&Ms that you have, God gave them to you. James 1.17 says it this way, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights. God is your source. And he doesn't just have a little jar of M&M's. Anybody ever been to the M&M factory? One of the M&M factories? Just, wow, not very many people. We went just a couple of years ago. And the colors of M&M's that you get in your packs and, and 
And at the store, there's just a handful of colors. But you go to the M&M store. We went to the one in Las Vegas on our way to visit our daughter. The cheapest flight was through there. We went through Las Vegas, spent a half a day there. And we went to the M&M factory. And they had tubes that were probably this big around. And at least they started on this, this corner here. And they, they, went, they went like 20 feet in the air. And they went all the way around this room to about over here. Stacked to the ceilings. Filled with M&Ms of colors that you have never seen before. And you could go up and add a little spigot and you could, you could pour them out in a bag or a container and you could get whatever color combination of M&Ms that you wanted. The whole, I mean, a, a tremendous diff amount of different colors. And you could take those home uh, after you paid for them. But here's the thing with God. Every perfect gift comes from Him. And while He gives you the ten, His supply is not lacking. The giver of good gifts is not lacking in supply. And sometimes we get a little bit afraid with the 10, the 10 M&Ms that we have. But God has given you 10 representing 100% of what you need to survive. And for most of us, the 10 M&Ms we have is way more than the 10% we need, the 100% we need to provide. But think about this. I don't know if you've been faithful to God or not, but it doesn't matter because here's the truth about you right now. God has 100% taken care of you everything you needed to this point. 100%. He's not missed a beat. Oh, you might have missed a meal. Some of, some of us have. There have been times when it gets tough. You, he might not have given it all to you the way you wanted, but He gave you enough that you're here today, and if you're not dead, and you're not, God has provided everything you need, and He calls us to honor him with the tangible assets that he gives us. The Old Testament teaches tithing. You know what the tithe is? If he gives you ten, you give him one. I don't know why he needs it. I don't, obviously, he doesn't if he owns all these, these ginormous amounts of everything. But he asked for it. He asked for the one. And Jesus confirmed the tithe in Luke chapter 11. And it's not about the m m it's about being faithful to what God calls us to do. Jesus speaking to the religious leaders in Luke 11 said this, Woe to you Pharisees! The Pharisees were the ones who were going to have Him killed. Woe to you Pharisees because you give God a tenth of your mint, your rue and all your other kind of garden herbs, but you neglect justice and the love of God. You should be should have practiced the latter without leaving the former meaning. You should practice the love and justice as well as the tenth. So love and justice and tithing, you can't exchange one for other. You can't give your way out of, out of an unfaithful and unloving relationship with God. And you can't love your way out of not participating in His ways. When God gives you a rutabaga, you chop it up and you divide it in ten. You give Him part of it. Ten, ten leaves, you give them that. We don't operate that anymore, right? But Jesus said, if you love me, do what I command. And he commends them in a way to say, Pharisees, you've done the right thing. And part of this, you've been meticulous in your giving and you've been systematic. You have given me from the tenth. And just a side note, these Pharisees killed Jesus and they gave the organization they were giving to was, was their own organization that they handled the money. And so you don't have to give it to a perfect place. You're not going to find a perfect church. This is not a perfect church. But we give to God. We don't give to organizations. And God fund, how does God fund His kingdom? Through the faithfulness of His people. Through the obedience and generosity of His own people. So if, if everybody here, they're say, let's, let's call it even 100 people here, and everybody gave it one, then that would mean they would, that, that you would have 900 M&Ms, and then the church would have 100 M&Ms. That would mean that would be 10, you divide that by 10, and that would be 10 full-time sufficiencies of the average of the congregation. That, that never happens in a church. But it's God's plan. He lays it out that way. We're also supposed to do the same thing with our energy, not just throw money at God, but we're also supposed to use our energy in that same way. But let me ask you this question. When I talk about the, the nine, 
and you're getting 100% of what you need, everybody's probably kind of happy about that. When I talk about the one, do you get nervous? Some of you are thinking, I wish I hadn't come today. And I'm wishing I didn't have to preach this sermon because I would just soon not talk about it because I'm not trying to get you to give. I'm not. I'm trying to find what's in the Word, share it with you. And like every week, what do we do? We say, this is what God says. I hope you'll do it. But if you don't, that's not on me. But many times our thoughts about giving the one back are scary. They're pretty scary. There was a, there was a, there was a parent, and he had his kids... And he gave him some M&M's. And he asked for the M&M. He said, hey, would you mind sharing a few of those with me? And the kids were like, what, what are you talking about? These are my M&M's. How long have they been the kids' M&M's? Like four seconds. But, but no. But no, they're my M&M's. And you don't ask for any. And the kid's unaware. And he needs to grow. And he needs to learn that, that, the, that the parent could just bless him like crazy. He could feed him like a little bird with M&M's. Just go. Mm-hmm. M&M's could go everywhere. I didn't do that in the first service because Linda was here. And we're that same way with God if we're honest. It's like, oh God, this is all right. it's mine, it's mine. Now i got M&M's in my mouth. i got to take a minute and chew them. Give me a second. I didn't think that through very well. Hmm. But that was good. Um, so in this story, do you see yourself as the parent? I mean, you're giving, you're giving to people around you. And when they don't respect it and they're not thankful, are you going to give them more? And do you see yourself as the kid in the story? I know. Thank you for all the stuff, and I'm just going to hoard it over here. I see myself clearly in both of those people. But I think sometimes we cheat ourselves out of the rewards and out of the blessings by not participating. Proverbs 3.11, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent His rebuke. Because the Lord disciplines those He loves as a father and son He delights in. And I think sometimes the lack of blessing we have in our life, both on the financial side, and I'm not a health and wealth preacher at all, but also on the spiritual side, on the emotional side, on the spiritual side, come from the fact that we're not participating. We're not participating in the program that God has clearly set up for us. And most of my difficulties, they end up coming from my own, own doing. And if you're not in the program, you're not going to get the reward. Let me give you a, a personal testimony, and it's I, I'm not... Hopefully you won't see this as braggadocious because it's not at all. My parents taught me to tithe when I was a kid. As a matter of fact, more than taught me to tithe, they made me tithe. Here's your allowance. Give me a dime. All right, here's a dollar. Give me a dime. It's like, what's this for? It's like, this goes to the church. It's like, that's not going to do any good at the church. When they made me tithe. Then I got, got my first paper route, and they made me tithe. Did you tithe on that? Was, yeah, my grandma especially is like, mm, son, you better be tithing. I said, like, Okay. I got my real first job, and I got paid $2.90 an hour. Man, I was rich. And I think I tithed on that. I can't really tell you for sure when I started tithing. But I recently ran across my very first tithe check I ever wrote. Here it is. It's uh, March 15, 1978. And there it is for you if you want to look at it there. Woo! So apparently I made $430, $435. So it appears to me I must have been catching up on my tithe if I only made $3 an hour and I only worked about 10 hours a week. So I must have gotten behind somewhere. And I wrote a check to God. And this, this was not a time in my life, I'm sorry to say, in my, high, my senior, high, senior year of high school, that I was walking with the Lord. And I'm, I'm not proud of that. I'm ashamed of that. But I made the check out and I wrote it probably mostly because it was kind of like insurance. I figure if I pay a God off a little bit, maybe he won't crush me like a bug. My understanding of tithing was very skewed. And, you know, perhaps it is a warranty program. Because God's promises to stretch your dollars. 
But I was thinking maybe he wouldn't bless me, but maybe he wouldn't crush me. And the good news is you don't have to understand all of what you find in the Bible to obey what you find in the Bible. You just got to jump up and say, it says it, it's crazy, and I'm going to do it. And God invites you today as He invites, invited me and he, and he invites everybody to test drive the tithe, the, one per, the 10%, the one M&M. You can kick the tires. You can take it for a spin. You can jump in and give it a try. And God says that's okay. Normally God says you should not. Normally God says you should not test me. Jesus, when he was tempted in that wilderness, uh, said to the devil, "It's written, do not put the Lord God to your test." But God specifically gives you permission and challenges you and challenges me to test drive the tithe. Malachi three ten. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you don't even have room for it. Now, I started tithing at a young age. I didn't really see these kind of storehouse blessings for many, 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 many years on the tangible side. I'll tell you what, on the spiritual side, on the He will direct your path side, on He will walk with you, on He will provide everything you need, He will give you peace in troubled time side, the blessings came down. And when you trust God, you just might overflow. You just might. You can test drive the tithe and it will not hurt God's feelings that you go in with a halfway attitude about it or a skeptical attitude about it. And when you do give to the Lord, what happens is, is He stretches what you have, but He also blesses what you give. Store up for yourselves in treasures in heaven where moth and rust don't destroy and where thieves do not break in and they don't steal your stuff. When you give to the Lord, when you give to God... He sends it straight up into the storehouse up above. So not only do you get the blessing of giving down here, but you get the blessing of being participating in God's eternal economy. We have a purpose and we have a, a reason. Number one, we want to honor God. We want to weight our stuff toward God. Number two, we want to see the kingdom expand as we grow in His Word. And then we reap these benefits. God says He'll multiply the nine you have left and He will store up for you in treasures and He will give interest on that. But while you give to the Lord, He also lets you choose the uh, reward program you would like. He does. He lets you choose. You can choose the zero reward program. You can choose the big one. Uh, here uh, in Corinthians, it says, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. He will multiply what you give. He will eternally reward you for giving. And He will bring joy into your life because it's more blessed, more happy to give than it is to receive. And God will bless you when you become that way. And notice that there's no arm twisting in this. I, I'm not, I didn't want to preach this sermon. I want to just skip over this and go to the next part of Proverbs because that's way more fun. But I, I'm trying to do the same thing I hope you're trying to do is when the Lord brings you something, you just say yes to it. And go, whatever happens. People get mad. People don't like it. I just got to do what the Lord wants me to do. But each man in Corinthians should... Decide in his own heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves this cheerful giver. God loves us to make our own decision. And when we prioritize our life, then we can make that decision. And you know the story of the widow's mite that was a, there uh, in, in Luke. As he looked up, Jesus saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. They were writing the big check. They were dropping the big coins in there, clanging and round. And he also saw a poor woman who put in two very small copper coins. You heard the saying, it doesn't have two coins to rub together? Well, she didn't. Well, she did for a minute, and then she gave it all away, and that was all she had. Jesus goes on to say, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has put in more than all the others, and all these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, she put in all that she had to live on. She didn't have much, but she threw it all in there. 
And the Bible doesn't tell us that she ever got any barns. It doesn't tell her she ever got any pots with, with wine overflowing. She did receive a verbal blessing from Jesus. So do you think she ever received the blessing that God promised? Oh, I know she has it now. I know she does. Sacrificial giving was, was, was her gift, and she probably lived the rest of her life poor as far as we know, and yet she's honored by the Lord, and the Lord will honor her eternally. It's not just to give from, enough to give from our enoughness. God calls us in to manage the nine. So it's like you, you think maybe, oh, I'm going to reach in here, I'm going to get the one, and I'm going to give it to God and go, whoo, I'm off the hook. Now I got, I got nine. I got nine. Spend on whatever I want. No. No. The Bible teaches stewardship. You're responsible now to use those for the kingdom's work. It doesn't mean you'll give them to the church. It doesn't mean you give them all away. But you manage those nine. You become a good steward of everything the Lord's given you. And you build a proper infrastructure. If you're going to have, a, if you're going to have overflowing barns, guess what you need? A barn. And unless you're just going to like pray and think God's a magic slot machine, you put your, put your one M&M in and go, oh, there's a barn just showed up on my property that I, didn't, that I didn't buy. Oh, look, and there's vats, and there's grape. Oh, a vineyard showed up. It's not going to work that way. He gives you the nine, and he says, be a good steward of it. Manage well with what I've given you. And you know what I find? You've heard the saying, put your money where your mouth is. Here's a truth that I've, I've found. People put their mouth where their money is. We go out to lunch today and we have a conversation. You'll talk about more than likely where you spend your money. You'll say something like, man, it's hot out here. But I'm glad I have air conditioning. And I just paid my AC guy because mine quit. And I'm happy to pay. Put my money where my mouth is. And I'm glad to put my mouth where my money is. So I'm going to say I'm glad to live in air conditioning. And if you love boats... You talk about boats. You love golf. You talk about golf and clubs and, and distances and all sorts of stuff that I don't care about. You talk about fishing and you talk about rods and reels and different things that I don't care about. We talk about musical instruments and all of you, your eyes will glaze over, but I'll talk about it. I'll talk about musical instruments and fun stuff like that. We talk about what we're invested in. And the Lord wants to be invested. He wants to be in our main investment. We're talking about Him. We're honoring Him. Because the M&M's, the money you have, just, just a tool. No one can serve two masters. He'll either hate one and love the other, or he'll cling to one and he'll despise the other. I just like mixed versions there for you. But we can't, we can't be chasing after the things of the world and then thinking we're going to just spend them all on ourselves and then we're going to find the blessing and the protection and, 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 and the beauty and peace and joy of God. He wants to participate with us in day-to-day -day life, and He expects us to participate with Him. So in closing, your view, my view of God must be elevated and rise above our view of money, for our desire for money, and from the fear, the real fear that comes from letting it go. And I think that's a big obstacle. We give, not out of compulsion, but to honor our God, our great and wonderful God. And He has a great reward for us. Let's pray. God, we are grateful for Your Word, and I know this is a hard truth. God, we don't shy away from what You've called us to learn, how You've called us to grow. I pray that You'll help us to say yes to You, and God, I know even in a message like this, you're speaking to hearts about other things, about, oh Lord, maybe baptism or membership or uh, specific sins that they have in their life. And I pray that each of us will do business with you in these moments. We'll say yes to you. And Lord, that you will continue to grow in our lives to be bigger and bigger and more weighted in all we say, think, and do. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptistchurch.org.